good okay so yeah so hello everyone i am bhavneet and i'm a first year phd student here and what i'm going to present today is rational tangles i have not written rational here uh surely because there was not space enough uh so yeah so i'll be talking about tangles and conway's theorem so this was part of my master's thesis actually uh, back in india and uh, i'll give you a brief introduction of knot theory and a very elementary proof of conway's theorem so this proof was originally given by uh, professor kaufman actually and the conway's theorem originally was stated without proof it was just purely intuition apparently and yeah so first of all before even going into tangles what is a knot okay and then we'll talk about the primary problem which we deal with in knot theory and i'll introduce what are tangles with respect to a knot and then what do we mean by rational tangles and define some operations on rational tangles and uh, by the end we will have enough definitions and prerequisites to prove one direction of conway's theorem okay so first of all what is a knot so in our everyday life we come across tie knots or shoelaces for example but these knots are not of mathematical interest uh one reason is that you can always untangle them because they have loose ends you can always untangle them so they don't uh, hold structure in a sense so one way to fix it is to fix these two ends and then try to untangle it it will it may untangle it may not untangle okay so we do that then we define a mathematical knot so a mathematical knot a very general definition from one of the books called rolson is a subset k of a space x is a knot if k is homeomorphic to a sphere sp it doesn't give out much and an even more general definition is that if k is a link uh, k is a link if k is homeomorphic to a disjoint union of all the spheres sp1 sp2 so on up to spr for our purposes although for tangles and for our knots for this presentation we will consider our x the space to be the three dimensional space and our sphere to be just s1 basically a circle and uh we can look at some examples actually one of them is a trefoil so it's called a three crossing knot and this one is a figure eight knot which is a four crossing knot and a sink foil which is called a five crossing knot what do i mean by crossing sir so if you have a string actually i do have a string okay uh let's say you s1 doesn't have thickness though but just for the sake of showing it to you what i mean if you have this a string in three dimensional space and if you knot it like this then this point it's in 3d i mean it's overlapping but if to represent it on a plane we have a little gap here so that is a crossing for us so what i mean by a three crossing knot is that you can like we are considering a string actually so we can manipulate it we can twist it or do anything with it right so when I, when i mean when i say that it's a three crossing knot i mean that any manipulation you do it will always have three crossings minimum okay and similarly for the four crossing knot in the sink foil to actually illustrate it a uh, trefoil can be represented by all of these diagrams in 3d space and similarly this this is the four crossing knot and this is also a four crossing knot and so on and so forth so you can make various manipulations with the string but that brings us to the question of equivalence of knots when can we actually say that this diagram is equivalent to this diagram one way to put it is that two knots k and k prime or the two knot diagrams k and k prime are equivalent if one can be deformed into another without breaking the loop or without intersection without singularities we don't want that 
a fancy name for it is ambient isotopy and uh, i will not get into the definition of ambient isotopy this is an elementary introduction so it's enough to understand that you don't want to break the loop you want to keep the loop intact moving on another example of a very seemingly very complex knot and we'll see that how it how it actually turns into just an unknot so if you consider this part is the color blue visible oh sorry the red color visible here yeah so if you consider this red part here so it's below the rest of the string so you can actually pull it out like this and then similarly you will see that this red part again is above this part of the string so you can pull it in and therefore we have this situation where again this red part is below this part of the string and then you can pull it in again and similarly this part so finally you are left with a situation where you just have to twist it and you'll get an unknot so these are some intuitive ways to manipulate the knot these are these were actually captured in a theorem by Rademeister in 1927 that two knots k and k prime with diagrams d d prime are equivalent if and only if their diagrams are related by a finite sequence d d not so on up to d n and such that d not the first diagram is your one of the d's and the last diagram is d prime so whatever moves we up, uh, whatever moves we did here they are captured by these three different types of moves the type 1 is just you twist it and type 2 is you pull it apart and in type 3 you just move the string beneath the other strings so yeah uh it's an if and only statement it uniquely represents the knot diagram moving on uh there was one problem with the rademeister moves that for example in this case you may just stop here and may not be able to you may not be able to always conclude that if a knot diagram is the same as the other diagram because you may not know when to stop so to solve this mathematicians came up with invariance what do i mean by invariance so you connect a knot with some other mathematical object it may be a polynomial it may be a geometric invariant it may just be a number in our case in tangle we will see that we associate with every tangle a number and similar and from a tangle we can make a knot so in conclusion you can actually associate to every knot a rational number so like uh, just for an example this was uh, the bracket polynomial this is called the bracket polynomial so how this works is that when you are given a trefoil or if you whenever you look at a crossing there are two ways you can change the crossing you can cut it and join it like this or you can join it like this so at every step at every crossing you have two options so that is what it represents so this way you join it one way and this way you join it the other way by this process you reach a bunch of unknots and each unknot can be represented as the power of a or b so from there you can actually get your polynomial i'll not get into the whole thing that why this works right now because we are looking at tangles so this is not actually a strong invariant in the sense that if uh, if we had a different conformation of a knot a different knot diagram for a trefoil then the polynomial would have been the same but we cannot say otherwise that if the polynomial is the same the knot diagram would be the same but if when we talk about the rational numbers it is a strong invariant it uniquely represents a knot so to get there first we will define what a tangle is for example if we draw a trefoil we draw a trefoil yeah so a tangle is like a building block of a knot 
So this represents a tangle. If you just take this part inside the circle, and it can even be as big as this. There are certain conditions to which you can actually, uh, to how you can actually define a tangle. It is an analog of a link, uh, and also we'll get to the conditions actually. So the first one is that the number of strands entering and exiting a tangle box. This dotted thing is called a tangle box. So the number of strings that enter and exit the tangle box has to be even. You cannot have something like this. This is not a tangle. Okay? The string has to come out. It has to be even. And there exists no free ends inside the tangle box. Since we have already discussed that if we have loose ends, you can always untangle the knot. And we are talking about strings or knots that are homeomorphic to a circle. So you cannot have loose ends like these. Okay? And the third one is not just is not a condition actually, but it's something that we will be using. That we will be dealing with tangles with two strands, that is four ends fixed on the tangle box. For instance, these ones. Now a uh, tangle is more general than a rational tangle. Uh, to define that, in a very vague sense, we can define rational tangles. This, def uh, this definition basically tells us if you have something like this, this is a rational tangle. All that it means is that if you allow this, these fixed ends, for tangles in general, you cannot move these ends on the tangle box. But if we allow these ends to move, then we should be able to unwind it, in a sense. This is a very, yeah. Can I ask a question? So, uh, the tangle box is a neighborhood around the crossing? Yes. So, you call something a tangle if every neighborhood is a tangle box, as you defined in the previous slide, right? I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Like yes, that is sort of like a building block is, for that. Is every knot a tangle then? E every every knot a tangle, yeah. Uh, yes, okay. because it's really zero really numbers of... Tangles are more general than that. They could be sort of, yes. Because even uh, if you draw an... Sorry, I think you said it earlier. I think I missed it. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, I, I don't think I have mentioned it actually. Even this is a tangle according to the definition, mm -hmm. right? And you can make it smaller and bigger, however you want. But you need it for a neighborhood around every crossing for, for it to be a tangle? Uh, the only thing is that the number of, like, uh, the loose ends on the tangle box should be even. It can be either 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. Yeah, that's part of the definition, yes. Right, but is it, is it like, if I were to just zoom into an area, I always have that, right? or can, I, can you show me an example where it's not true, but it's also still just, it's part of Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think you're asking that, can it be odd? Yeah. It cannot be, actually. Okay, so because, it, right, yeah, because it's a circle. I mean, it's an S1. Uh, did I answer your question? I think so, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, in a weak sense, uh, a rational tangle is just something that you can unwind if you are allowed to move these ends. Both of these, all of these ends actually. And Conway said that two rational tangles are ambient isotopic. Ambient isotopy, as I said, it's just that you can manipulate it however you want. You just don't have to break the loop. And two ta rational tangles are ambient isotopic if and only if their fractions are equal. Now, we have not yet discussed what those fractions are. So now we will try to build that how do we associate a fraction to this thing here. Okay, so to build that, first we will discuss what's an horizontal integer tangle. We call it TA. It's denoted by TA here and what do I mean by A is that 
it is either rotated in a positive or a negative direction mod a number of times and the sign of a represents a convention for example in this case you take this horizontal axis and you look at it look at it from the right hand side and if it's twisted in the clockwise direction it's a positive twist and if it's twisted in an anti clockwise direction out of the paper it's negative so this one represents a t minus 3 and this rep this represents t3 uh, similarly we can define a vertical integer tangle i haven't drawn the tangle box here but we'll assume that these ends are fixed okay okay moving on to vertical integer tangles they have the same concept just that we look at it through on the vertical axis and from the bottom and if it's uh yeah if it's anti clockwise in a sense then it's a positive twist and on the vertical axis if it's a clockwise twist then it's a negative uh negative t3 yeah um just a fair warning this all looks very tedious and forced but it turns into a very nice solution in the end so like it can be a bit boring so just let me know <laughs> so uh now to define what is called a horizontal sum in like uh, in even knots we have horizontal sums it will not uh there are certain conditions on how you can actually add to knots horizontally in tangles as well if this is some a tangle and this is the tangle box and these are the loose ends a horizontal sum mean that on the horizontal axis you just join the two ends then similarly we have the vertical sum you just do it on the vertical axis it's represented by a plus dash then moving on one thing to note is that if you have two horizontal tangles ta and tb they can simply be represented uh i'll draw it actually so if you have normal horizontal tangles like this and there's another horizontal tangle this is just this is the horizontal sum and if this represented ta and this represented tb we can simply represent it by ta plus b now note that when you add it the tangle box expands sort of this is the tangle box now and you see that you can actually change it to t1 if you pull it upwards what you get is this so effectively what that means is that you can add two tangles and represent it in numbers as well if you have t3 and like in this case we had t2 and t minus 1 so that just adds to t minus 1 t i'm sorry t minus 2 and t1 so you get t minus 1 similarly for the vertical integer tangles so that reduces some of the stuff for us to handle you can club all the horizontal tangles if they are added in a sequence moving on now that we have horizontal and vertical uh, integer tangles we can actually define what a rational tangle is so we'll say that a rational tangle given a sequence of integers a1 a2 so on up to an and a sequence of integer tangles ta1 associated with each integer and now we say that tai can either be this or this either it can be a vertical integer tangle or a horizontal integer tangle and we define b1 as ta1 now if k is less than equal to 1 and if our ta k plus 1 is a horizontal integer tangle then our b k plus 1 can either be a left sum or a right sum uh left horizontal sum or the right horizontal sum 
and also if it's a vertical integer triangle it can either be added on the top or on the bottom so using this process whichever triangle you get is a rational triangle um yeah so the triangle you get at end of the at the end of the whole sequence is a rational triangle now as we said before that if x is equal to a plus b like in this case you had minus 2 and 1 then you can either represent it as two different triangles as d a t b or you can just write d x so this reduce again this reduces some of the work for us so what we're trying to do here is that we are looking at all different kind of operations that are possible that can be done on rational triangles and we try to show that most of them are ambient isotopic they can be clubbed together and at the final stage a magically a fraction appears now another thing a flip theorem this is called a flip theorem so all it says is that if you have a rational triangle and if you flip it 180 degrees either along the vertical axis or along the horizontal axis the triangle remains the same the triangle we get is ambient isotopic so what this how this helps us is that it tells us that either you add it to the uh, either you add an angle to the left or you add that angle to the right it does not make a difference okay how do we prove that the proof is by induction actually and the induction is on the number of integer tangles n which we have with us if we have just one tangle let's say you have t a or t prime t a prime if you flip it 180 degrees it does not make much of a difference to look at it if either uh, yeah so if you have if if you were to flip it across the this axis what you get is this Does make a difference. Okay, I'll check this out. Okay, and I am flipping actually along the vertical axis. Am I making a mistake? Because the previous line it said rotation and then in parentheses it said flipping. Yeah. No, uh, no you're, make, you're making a 180 degree rotation yes. like this. Okay, okay, so you threw the data. Yeah. That is a mistake actually. I'm sorry, I'll check it again. And anyways, for the sake of the presentation, I'll assume the first case and uh I think you're saying that either flip or rotation can be I think what you're trying to say yeah. here, if you do either rotation or flip, you still have. Oh, yeah. That would be the best option. That is actually correct. Thank <coughs> you. Yeah, that makes I, I, sense. If you look at your picture, right? I mean, this, um, yeah. You flip D or you rotate D. Right. Okay, yeah. Actually, I read it wrong. So, yeah. Thank you so much. So, what it actually means is that 
either you rotate it 180 degree or you flip it 180 degrees then these two will be ambient isotopic it will not be isotopic to this one that is correct actually so if you see if you rotate it 180 degrees flip it 180 degrees there and if you flip it 180 degrees on the along the horizontal axis you get the same thing yes okay So our first case is saved thanks to Lewis and for the induction hypothesis that we assume this for k less than equal to n and now to check for n plus 1 we assume it for b and we check what happens when we add a integer triangle to the left or we add an integer triangle to the right or we simply add it to the top or the bottom. To actually see it I will first show the diagram. Let's say this was B and you added a T3 to this one, okay. Now since B, we have already, we have already assumed an induction hypothesis that we can flip it and it will still be the same. So we can flip it multiple times. So when we have added T3 plus B, we have in, uh, these four ends are fixed. So when you flip it, this will get tangled in a way. So and you flip it again thrice and you can shift T3 to T3 here, okay. So yeah, that is one way, these are called flip moves and this actually uh, solves our third case when we have to check that n plus 1 for uh, this case actually. So uh, when you apply flip moves, can, uh, when you repeatedly apply flip moves, you can you can actually shift the whole T3 to this side, and this is same as making a 180 degree flip or rotating it 180 degrees. So that gives us our flip theorem. And if B, that actually tells us that either you add an integer triangle to the left or the right, it does not make that, it does not make a difference. It will still be the same. And similarly for top and bottom. Okay. Some more definitions. So we have basic horizontal tangle, uh, which is a rational tangle. So this uh, defines a certain way to construct a rational tangle. So we start with the horizontal uh, tangle TA1 and then we add a vertical tangle T-A2 on the bottom and then horizontal tangle on the right. For example, this one. We started with the T3 and we started with a T3 and we added a tangle T negative 1 on the bottom and then we added another tangle on the right. So now if you see that any rational tangle can be of this form because we have shown that either you add it to the left or to the right it does not make a difference or you add it to the top or the bottom it does not make a difference. Similarly we have the basic vertical tangle. So again how we construct it is that we start with a vertical tangle now and then we add a horizontal integer tangle on the left and then a vertical tangle on the bottom and we repeat these steps until we, I mean we can repeat it any number of times, n number of times, finite number of times. So these two basic horizontal tangle and the basic vertical tangle can represent any rational tangle. This is a theorem because According to flip theorem, it does not matter, you either add to the left or to the right, it will give you the same ambient isotopic rational tangle. So yeah, we have the theorem that every rational tangle is isotopic to a basic, ambient isotopic to a basic tangle. Some more operations which can be applied on the rational tangles, one of which is a mirror image. What do I mean by mirror image is that we reverse every crossing. It's not literally a mirror image like if this was a tangle we make it this 
we just reverse all the crossings. If it's an undercrossing, we change it to an overcrossing. Second one is that we rotate it clockwise by 90 degrees and then take a mirror image. And the third one is we rotate it anti-clockwise 90 degrees and we take the mirror image again. So these are the three operations. This negative B can also be represented by B asterisk, B star. And we have 1 over CB and 1 over CC because it's counterclockwise. So defining clock counterclockwise and clockwise inverses does not make much of a difference because according to flip theorem, we can they are actually ambient isotopic. We can apply the flip theorem twice, like in this one, we can flip it and then rotate it, we'll get the same thing. Okay? So uh, Clockwise inverse and a counterclockwise inverse of a rational triangle are the same thing. Further, there is a proposition actually. It's a proof is very simple. You can use the definitions we have already done to simply prove that every basic horizontal, if B is a basic horizontal triangle, then 1 over C B, the clockwise inverse, is a basic vertical triangle. And if B is a basic vertical triangle, then a counterclockwise inverse is a basic horizontal triangle. So, what they mean to say is that they are ambient isotopic. An easier case to see is that a vertical triangle TA is a clockwise inverse TA. An example if you have this. as your vertical integer triangle and you take a clockwise inverse this will be t negative 2 and if you take a clockwise inverse what they mean is you rotate it by 90 degrees clockwise and what you get by that So when you actually, yeah. So yeah. Count, huh? That's all you've done is rotate. You yes, to I've rotated counterclockwise, and when we take a mirror image, we have to flip all the crossings. So we get this. So that is basically your T two. So you have T dash A, your vertical integer triangle is either the clockwise inverse or the counterclockwise inverse. And also, it does not matter either you take a counterclockwise inverse or a clockwise inverse. We already have that they are ambient isotopic. And then another thing that if we start with the horizontal integer triangle and we add a vertical integer triangle to the right that is similar to saying this. This is a horizontal sum. This is not a vertical sum. And similarly, if we have a basic horizontal triangle, in the basic horizontal triangle, how we start is that we start with the horizontal integer triangle and we add a vertical integer triangle on the bottom. So that is the initiation, like that is how we start a basic horizontal triangle. And that is similar to writing this. And lastly. For 4, for 1 over T either, um, is that to be 1 over, one over counterclockwise or 1 over clockwise? It can be either actually okay. because it does not make a difference. Okay. Even writing this here, is not important either. And lastly, that if we if you have addition of two basic, this is a basic horizontal triangle or two basic horizontal triangles or basic vertical triangles or a mix of both, you take a mirror image, and that is similar to writing taking a, a reciprocal in a sense, like taking a fraction. 
so this is mostly representation this does not mean much in the sense that uh, like you're not actually putting the tangle below it below something or anything you're applying some operation and you represent it this way so the idea of representing it this way is that let's say you have this tangle with you you start with a t2 tangle and you add a vertical integer tangle on the bottom and then you add a horizontal integer tangle on the right this can be represented as this you have uh, using the operations before if using the this one this operation we can write this and similarly you just add t6 to the left it does not make a difference either you add it to the left or the right. We have already done that. The flip theorem, right? So this gives us a basic horizontal tangle. And similarly, we can have the basic vertical tangle. If you start with the vertical integer tangle and then you add to the left a horizontal integer tangle and then to the bottom another vertical integer tangle, then you can represent this thing as a continued fraction form sort of so this gives us a basic vertical tangle and we've already done a theorem that every rational tangle is either a basic horizontal tangle or a basic vertical tangle so we can generalize that a rational tangle will either look something like this where a1 a2 a n are all integers or this the next step is to just replace TAI with ANs, the integers. So you get a continued fraction form. So this is how we associate a fraction to a rational tangle. What it remains to show is that this fraction actually can uniquely represent a knot, a rational tangle. So we'll do one direction of Conway's theorem. Uh, this is before that actually so we'll define a function called f of b where b is any basic tangle and f of t a is simply a as we had simply replaced t a n by a n s and so on and so forth so and f of t prime a is just a reciprocal of that then we can show that f of t a plus b is f of t a like uh, it distributes and then uh, if we take a mirror image negative of t a is same as t negative a and yeah the negative can be taken out and f of t a we know it's a and similarly for the vertical integer tangle you have negative 1 over a so yeah and if you have taken if you are given a basic basic rational tangle and you take a mirror image here then you just have to put a negative sign in front of the associated fraction so yeah we get to the one direction of Conway's theorem that given t1 and t2 be basic tangles and that f of t1 is equal to f of t2 then t1 is ambient isotopic to t2 so we'll complete the proof in three parts first of all we'll show that there exists a continued fraction form called a regular continued fraction form which is uniquely determined for a given rational number and second we show that there exists a formulation which allows any given continued fraction form you see that when, it, when we have that tangle representation we get a continued fraction form so we want to show that any continued fraction form can be represented by a regular continued fraction form can be turned into a regular continued fraction form the idea is that that correction which we apply does not change the isotopy class of the tangle so that is the final step of the proof okay so what do i mean by a regular continued fraction form the idea is that except a n all of these need to be positive integers a n minus 1 so on up to a 1 so this is uh, this is unique by construction 
for example if you start with 3.14 for example so you can write it as 3 plus 7 over 50 so the process to get a regular continued fraction form is that you take a reciprocal here and then you extract out the uh, you extract out the integer part and the fraction part and you take the fraction part you again take the reciprocal and you get finally this continued fraction form a more general way is that if you are given any rational number p over q then we take the floor function of p over q and what we are left with is the fractional part of p over q and we can write it as this we take the reciprocal not the reciprocal actually it's same thing but uh, now from this part as well we extract out the integer part and then we take the fraction form and we see that if this form is of the type 1 over n where n is a positive integer we can stop if it's not then we apply the second step again then the third step and so on and so forth so we get the regular continued fraction from form from there now to see that uh, uh, we can get uh, from the rational tangles or the sorry from the tangles we can get a fractional form of even this kind 3 minus 1 over 2 so these negative signs we don't want these negative signs here so to shift that we use Lagrange's formula that a minus 1 over b is just a minus 1 plus 1 over 1 plus b minus 1 so you can take it there make the ground the same and see that these are actually equal why is it named after him? why is it named after him? Huh? yeah he gave it actually but anyone can do that yeah <laughs> Yeah, he did it. <laughs> so, yeah, so using this formula, we can actually convert our this fractional form into this one, which is a regular continued fraction form. So, we have shown so far that there exists a unique form, and any continued fraction form can be turned into that unique form, but we still need to show that this correction does not change the tangle so to do that we have this whole series of steps we take let's say we start with any uh, tangle b here and we add to it the minus one means we add a, a integer tangle t minus one to this one to b now we take a uh, you have a question so, in this step, next we take a counterclockwise inverse or a clockwise. In this case, we took a clockwise inverse and we shifted it to this side and we took a mirror image and then we added one integer tangle to it. Now, again, we take a counterclockwise inverse and B star meant the, the mirror image. And we had already once taken a clockwise inverse, it made it a mirror image now. When we again take a counterclockwise inverse, it's back to B now. So we have 1 over 1 plus B minus 1 here. Now note that this part is inside the tangle box and this can be pulled to this side, right? Because it's above B and above these two strings. So we get this now. And since whole of this thing is inside the tangle box, we can manipulate it however we want. We can shift this, we can, I mean, take, uh, rotate it in a sense. And we rotated it and got this. Now, from here, we just added a horizontal integer tangle of negative twist and then added A. Now, if you see that this thing is inside the tangle box and you can just pull it and then you get a and b and this is nothing but uh, the clockwise inverse negative b so you have that if you know even if you manipulate it, it into this you have the same isotopy class so that 
uh, proves our Conway's theorem because any fraction is uniquely represented by a regular continued fraction form and further any continued fraction form can be converted to a regular continued fraction form and that manipulation does not change the tangle. So what it means if two fractions are same then the tangles have to be ambient isotopic. That is one direction and the other direction maybe we can do some other time. Yes. And yeah. yeah okay. Because that requires a whole different it uh, invariant and everything. So yeah. So uh, this was largely based on paper by Kaufman and Goldman on rational tangles, and the definitions were from Rolfson and of course the notebook. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, tangles are like the building blocks, mm -hmm. so it really helps to study them specifically and up to seven crossing knots, all of them are rational knots actually. So if you are given a tangle, you can just remove the tangle box and join these two strings up and down, so you get a knot. So, so it's, I'm forgetting now, is every knot representable by tangle box like that, both by what you just said, right? Can yeah. I write it out as a knot in the box? Yeah. 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 You can do it in a very specific way. There's a, there's a really nice way to figure out the amount that you get. To yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, general question, maybe. Uh, yeah. If you know. Is there like a best variant people have found? Like there's not what actually. People are still stuff? looking. Yeah, uh, the best not great. The not Not uh, some but it just is impossible to exactly. It's a really, really difficult invariant to actually get your head around, especially when you're talking about like real infinite study points. Yeah. I mean, people are coming up with invariants all of the time. Yeah, I think. yeah. People are the especially with polynomial invariants. Isn't Kaufman famous for that? Kaufman is famous for doing it by hand, actually. If you look at his papers, he draws all of the diagrams by hand. Like he is really into looking at the intuition of it. Actually, Although imagining the knots. Thinking of Jones. Yeah. Well, so Jones, yeah, Jones was. He Kaufman came up with a way of calculating the Jones polynomial. Yeah. In and, he, and as he said, it was done entirely by diagrams. Right. Jeez. I mean, originally Vaughan Jones did something very entirely different, but uh, like uh, you saw the span. The, uh, I'll show you actually. Like this thing here, this is actually the bracket polynomial. Yeah, so Kaufman defined that and then through that he defined uh, with scale relation and everything he defined yeah, the Jones like polynomial. A, like a it's like a Jones polynomial has an actual extra parameter in this. Yes. For it's because this is uh, there are three Rydermeister moves. For the type two and type three Rydermeister move, this works. But for the first Rydermeister move, this does not capture that. So Kaufman added that. Uh, Jones polynomial was already doing that, but when trying to define it in an elementary way, Kaufman added a uh, factor to it, negative a negative 3 here, mm -hmm. like this thing. So that basically corrects for those twists. Um, so I think when we were talking about earlier, several times that the there are some really practical relations with studying modules, right? Things like vertices and, uh, sorry, vertexes and, uh, oh yeah, I mean, the, I'm sorry to interrupt, but sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah, go on. Uh, I was just going to say, that, so, I can see the, the applications here, but um, I was wondering, A, what's, what's the reason, are there practical reasons for studying other types of maps, like not in R3 and not in S1 maps? S1 also, the second question was going to be, how much are these other knots there? Because this already seems complicated. So how much are these other knots there? So um, I'm not very well aware with what they actually do with it. But people do study knots in RP2 and in R3 and in higher dimensions as well. 
but uh, for example there was a recent paper by Lisa Picorelli solving the Conway's problem which was very old 125 years old or something so in that uh, it was we were only up till 10 crossing knots and on the 10 crossing knot there was there were two particular knots they were not able to distinguish so they use a concept of they use a study of knots in four dimensions and a concept called splicing and through that they were able to check that whether two knots are actually different okay. so it's mostly i as far as i know it's mostly to have different kinds of invariants so we can study knots up to however crossings we want to but I'm not sure about why people do it in RP2 though. Well, you define invariance, but it's useful to I think yes. 